Well, hey guys, it's Flower Gothic, and welcome to part one of Reaper's Creek, the final Onision book that I will read. I'm, I think there's a fourth book, but from what I've heard, it's very pornographic, so I ain't going to tell today with a tanfo clown pole. This reading is going to be a little different because instead of seeing a um, montage of Onision meltdown clips, you will see my beautiful face reading in real time. And here's the thing, I originally was going to do a reenactment of this. Just go outside and reenact every single scene from this cursed ass book, but a couple weeks ago, I realized, one, I don't want to do that. Two, Onision doesn't deserve a true cinematic adaption of his work. Three, I need to prioritize my other big projects instead of this one. And four, I'm a lazy cunt. <laughs> I tell you, editing a five hour iCarly video puts a lot of things into perspective. But the saddest part is I even bought this like Von Dutch cap because I was going to do a joke that um, when I was playing Daniel, it was going to look like Prince Daniel or at least how he dressed in the 2000s. So now I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. <laughs> I might like give it to someone. I don't know. But without further ado, here is Reaper's Creek Part 1. The last Onision book. Reaper's Creek by Onision. There is more! Before you read this book, I want you to understand something. All of my books, Stones to Abigail, Abigail spelled incorrectly, even though he's the one that fucking wrote it, This is Why I Hate You, and now Reaper's Creek. They are not works of pure fiction. These are stories from my own life mixed in with my imagination. Which is why I'm technically counting it as fan fiction. Many of the things told in these stories reflect on who I really was, what act to Ali happened, and what was going on in my mind. Stones to Abigail represented the better version of myself. Many of the events in that book happened in real life as well. Oh, like, uh, your girlfriend, uh, being beaten up so badly by her ex that the baby died and that she was shunned by the guidance counselor because she was pro-life? Did that actually happen? This is why I hate you represented the darker version of myself. Various aspects of that book were derived from my actual life, too. Uh, in very warped ways in which... You are represented as the hero in all the situations where you were a douche. But this book, this one is simply myself, who I was both good and bad during the time the story takes place. As you read, I leave it up to you to decide what events really happened and what is a product of creativity. Again, this is why I'm counting it as fan fiction. Chapter one, welcome to the creek. I was home, dot dot dot, finally. My father had taken me so many places. I'm assuming he meant too many places. When I was in Ohio, he bought me so many two space things. But maybe that was just to make up for the missing child support payments. Everyone seemed so worried about what their ex would do with their money, as if they are a completely different person than who they originally fell in love with. I mean, that's kind of a thing that happens in relationships that don't work out. What made you trust them in the first place? And why did your trust suddenly go away just because my mom left you? Because your mom left him. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> I couldn't hear much of anything over the furnace blasting in my ears. The tiny window at the base of my bed my stepdad built me allowed a subtle glow of light to peer in. I crawled over to the window to see my sister, Joanna, playing outside with our geese. She was happy to be home as well. Summer this year was strange, dot dot dot. There was a girl there. When I looked at her, I, it felt like she was staring right through 
Two Space Me. She had curly brown hair. Her parents were both from Latin America. Capitalized incorrectly. She was so cute. She was my favorite part of church every Saturday. That's not incorrect, by the way. Onision was raised as a Seventh Day Adventist, and they observe church on Saturday, not Sunday. In the entire state of Ohio itself. At this point, she is my main reason to return next summer, as I have no idea what to do with my father. Joanna just says, Ditto whenever she talks to my dad on the phone after he says he loves her. I wonder if he has caught on to the fact she says that because of the things my mom told her about her biological father. Things I think might be true. And um, we would show that, but that would lead to character development, which is illegal in an Onision fanfiction. I climbed on my bed, hanging by chains over my water heater, washer, and dryer. That's right, I live in an 8x6 box. It sits by the kitchen in my 900 square foot home. The dimensions are 10 by 10 by 10, and it is listed at $73,000 on Zillow. But it's paradise here. When I'm at my dad's house, it feel, my bad, I feel like I'm in some kind of cookie cutter Christian bubble cult. I mean, aren't Seventh Day Adventists a cult? I'll admit that I haven't done a lot of research on that sect, but um, from my understanding, they do have some pretty problematic beliefs. Everyone is smiles. Everyone is doing something, going somewhere, but how, they, how can they ignore how corrupt they are? I see past them showing off their pearly ivory teeth every time they see me. As usual, Onision self-insert is the one person in the plot who sees things the right way. He sees through the madness and the fakeness of the world. He is the only one that is authentic. He needs to find his authentic girl in order to feel whole. That's literally the plot of every Onision book. They are hiding from themselves. They are still breaking many of the fragile people they encounter and smiling just the same. Walking outside, my stepdad is working on making another bed with his bare hands. Just like the bed he made me, the bed that somehow allowed me to exist with my own space in such an unlikely place. Where would I be going to bed with? Out of the contraption he made me? In the bathroom? Or maybe we just hang, enter a blanket from the ceiling in our little wooden front room. Hi, Papa, I said as my stepdad chipped away. He looked at me with his goofy bus dash stash bending to a smile. Hey there, Greg. <gasps> he didn't even bother with a fake name this time. He just went with Greg. <laughs> I know his legal name is James now, but when he wrote this, wasn't his legal name still Gregory? Like Gregory Avaro? I'm making this bed for your cousin, Rod, and I'm gonna give it as a gift to your aunt, Laura, and uncle, Mark. I smiled and replied, oh, cool, and thought about what he was getting out of it. My stepdad had so much time on his hands, dot, dot, dot. Maybe he was putting food on the table, or maybe he was just trying to be everyone's friend. Maybe it's Maybelline. The problem with friends is they aren't bound to you by blood. There is no promise that they will never go away. You know, except for um, the mom that left your dad. Sometimes I feel like my real friends are in the woods that surround my house. The creek that runs by it, dot, dot, dot. They don't leave me. They don't lie to me. They tell me who they are and they never change. Well, until your local lumber mill decides to chop down all that forest to make um, new copies of Fifty Shades of Grey. Do people still read Fifty Shades of Grey? I don't care. Hey, dork, belted my sister, who was no longer playing with the geese. Oh, hi, Joanna. What are you doing? I said with a smirk. She replied, none of your busy dashness, loser. This was typical, Joanna being irrational. What are you talking about? This is just normal sibling squabble. Why did she say hi to me if she did not want to talk? Oh, right, to call me a dork and move on. I wanted to go up the trail to the swing alone, but I felt a familiar dew on my feet. Of course, 
I wasn't wearing any socks or shoes yet. Hey, Daniel! Want to help me out over here? Wait. Whoa. Wait, 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 wait. You established earlier on this page that your name was Greg. And now you're saying that your name is Daniel? Well, all right, guess I'm gonna have to change everything. Fuck! Hey, Daniel, want to help me out ever here? My stepdad was trying to insert a section of the bed into enter a supporting pole, but the teeth of the headboard kept wobbling around, making it a two-man job. My stepdad was a tall man, maybe six foot one inches. He had a haircut like he was in the Beatles band. W which era? They had like a lot of different haircuts. But the caterpillar above his lip, I'm assuming mustache, Threw the look off, I all dash ways admired how healthy he looked because most everyone else's age looked like they were well on their way to getting diabetes. Well, that's what happens when your stupid, dumbass government decides to subsidize junk food like chips and candy and cola instead of actually subsidizing healthy food, therefore leaving people stricken with poverty to gain diabetes because, you know, fuck them! Fuck poor people! They should just stop being poor and then they can eat healthy! Am I right, US government? In case you can't tell, I'm improvising this. What are you waiting for, kid? My stepdad asked. I replied, sorry, Papa. I gotta go grab shoes. One second. He replied with a dad-like frustrated but friendly voice. All right, then. Slipping on some shoes inside, I ran back out and pushed the teeth of the head dashboard into the associated slot so he could firmly put the side of the headboard, bought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, into the supporting beam. My stepdad said, Thanks, buddy. I'll let you know if I need more help. The baseboard should be no problem as it's shorter, though. I entered, laughed, and hugged him. I'm going up the hill, Papa, I said. He replied, Okay, kid. Running up the hill, I got hit by a lot of stickers. Those are plants that basically get stuck to your clothes by hooking them with their sharp prongs or by otherwise having a natural adhesive on them. Motherfucker. Every kid has to deal with stickers. They're not a new phenomenon. I didn't really worry about the stickers at this point, however. It was the nettles I'm afraid of. Those push little needles in your skin and cause pretty significant pain. Oddly enough, if you boil them, apparently they make a decent stew. Soup, my bad, soup, not stoop. But make no mistake, they are basically the jelly space fish of plants. Are you not adding compound words in order to enhance your word count? Don't do that, that's the, sh that's the quitter's way out. I didn't raise no quitter on you, Gregory. Getting past all the stickers, I was finally to it, the tree, the massive, beautiful tree with a rope hanging down, just at the right length so you could swing on it, with dash out, smacking your body into any nearby trees. Climbing up the black and yellow twisted rope, I grabbed on and began to swing around. Woo-hoo! I screamed almost every time. I was so happy to finally be at the place I belonged. It didn't matter I was wearing my pajamas still. It didn't matter that I was wearing a t-shirt supporting a non-Christian TV show. I wasn't at my biological dad's anymore. I was alone in the woods. I was free. And I'm free. Free falling. Oh, oh, boom, boom. Suddenly, I saw the face of my bully show up in front of my eyes. It was Philip. And immediately after, everything went black. I felt a small amount of blood dripping down my stomach. My eyes were closed. Without opening my eyes, I rolled backwards onto my back. No shit. I opened my eyes and saw only trees above me. I was still outside, in the woods alone. The birds were chirping. The sun rays were peeking through the leaves and pine. The air was so beautiful smelling, and I could hear little insects crawling around me, minding their own business. Everything was right where it should be. What happened? Looking down, I could see the white t-shirt I was wearing now had a hole on it and a blood spot. I had fallen off the rope swing after I fainted. Why did I see Phil Dash Ip's face? Fuck. Walking down the hill and into the yard, Joanna said with her basic brown teen dash ager haircut and her clothes that were too tight for her plump body type. Brought to you for no reason whatsoever, you misogynist ass. Oh my god, dork, are you gonna die or something? 
I replied, yes, Joanna, I'm going to die. Don't come to my funeral. You would somehow make it suck any mo even more. Joe asked Anna, what the fuck is with these dashes? Yelled back a fake laugh as I walked into the house. She had nothing else to say. Stepping across the wood floor, my mom painted white as a result of our pets peeing on our former carpet till it was unbearable to have around. I walked in to enter the bathroom, now putting pressure on my wound. I took off my shirt and threw it in the tiny trash bin. Looking into the bathroom mirror, I gazed at my own face. Same Daniel as always. Sharp jawline, acne on my face, bushy eyebrows, and abnort dash mully tall for an 11 year old. Excuse me, what the fuck? You know... When I'm reading Onision books, I always assume the protagonist is some dumb teenager because they all sound the same. Greg sounds the same as Arthur. Arthur sounds the same as Daniel. Daniel sounds the same as James and so on and so forth. But this child is 11? 11. Granted, when I was 11, I thought I was the only one who could see through the falseness of people. I was the only genuine person to ever exist. But, um, if you see my previous videos, you would know that I was kind of psychotic at the time for multiple reasons. So, I don't count that. I was just a kid. My brown hair was also boring. I thought about dyeing it all the time, but my mom said I was too young. It's also against the dress code. Looking down, I could, dash, see my wound. Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. It was actually incredibly superficial. Maybe the sharp stick I had fallen on when I blacked out had hit a rib. I imagine if I hit somewhere else, I would have at least dug deeper. So what I'm assuming here is that Philip, um, punched Daniel in the face or somewhere and that caused him to fall and like hit a branch on his way down and it just gored him slightly. Time for my favorite part, pouring hydrogen peroxide on my wound and watch dash in the science project explode in front of me. Felt like I had enough outdoors for that day. It was time to retire to my bed dash room and play video games the rest of the day. My game of choice, Metal Gear Solid, a game that had been unwittingly programming my worldview, causing me to prematurely judge or reflect on aspects of our world I could not have consent dash erred until I was at least an adult without it. Mom gets home at five o'clock. End chapter. <laughs> It just ends there? <laughs> oh my fucking god. So one chapter in, the protagonist's name is changed, mid-page, and apparently this kid's 11. Yet sounds like all the teenage characters Onision has written to represent himself. Fuck's wrong with you, man? Chapter two, the cold glass smack. My mom was a little late getting home. Traffic. She threw her keys on the ta dash bleh and hugged her husband, my stepdad, Donnie. I absolutely fucking hate it when people feel the need to reiterate familiar familial relations in their literature. Like, I know, I know, Lucille, that your mother's name is Anne and your father's name is Tom and you have a brother who plays for the Washington football team. I actually do not remember his name. It doesn't matter. That's a different story altogether. My point is, do not repeatedly talk about your familial relations. Like, I get it. J just say my stepdad. She hugged my stepdad and I will get the idea for the love of God. How are my kids? My mom asked. Papa replied, these little rascals, they're alive. My mom glowed at Papa, clearly not satisfied with the bare minimum requirement that we not die on his watch. I guess she has no sense of humor. My mom proceeded to telling us to fend for ourselves for dinner with her mat dash Tid down dyed red hair and basic makeup smeared after a long day's work. She was off to take a shower and spend the rest of the day watching VHS movies on her 13 inch TV in her bedroom laying on the custom log bed Papa had made her. VHS movies? Metal Gear Solid? I'm assuming this takes place in the 2000s. Interesting. Joanna walked into the front room and yelled through the door to my mom, asked Dashing, Hey mom, can I go to Uncle Matt's house for the bond space fire? My mom, enter, screamed back, I don't care! So Joanna immediately smiled and ran off to get her jacket. I wanna go, I screamed after Joanna. Joanna replied, I don't care, just stay away with me. I'm guessing, um, Daniel 
Damn Daniel realized that if he does not go with Joanna, he's probably not going to be able to eat for the rest of the day. So, you know, at least they offer hot dogs at bonfires, I think, I don't know. I smiled and ran to get my own coat as well. Our neighborhood was a quiet place. We lived in the middle of nowhere. Our neighbor's houses were a good thousand feet from one another, at the very least leaving us to easily mind our own business at all times. Yeah, that sounds like the Pacific Northwest. The creek ran through our small village. Could it be Reaper's Creek? Mostly family members were in the area, which is why my mom clearly had no problem with us running over to a bond space fire after the sun had all dash ready gone down. To get to my uncle's, we had to cross a bridge that was falling apart. It had boards with giant nails punched through them. That makes a bridge! Good thinking there, Onision! The boards weren't quite parallel or consistent in width or length. The bridge had Oh, the bridge handrails, my bad. Its support system was made up of metal cables. Tiny wires wrapped around one another, slowly rusting over time. To say the bridge was not appropriate for a child as young as myself, 11, would be an understatement. After crossing the slippery bridge in the dark, we could see the Bond Space Fire people laughing and clearly already mostly intoxicated. I'm all trusting my family, but considering how much alcohol ran through our bloodline, I'm guessing he meant alcoholism here. I'm not sure why she would at this hour. The night was mostly uneventful, till one of my uncles offered me some whisk dash key. I was mostly opposed to drinking alcohol and drugs in, in general because, you know, this is when, um, when you're in middle school, you're frequently visited by the dare people. Don't do drugs or alcohol ever or you will die. Die. But I was even more worried about drinking off the same bottle as my uncle. Strangely enough, I am more anti-germs than anti-drugs. And I am really anti-drugs. Come on, Daniel! Take a sip! My uncle screamed. He was the oldest of all the kids in my mom's immediate family and lived across the creek from my uncle. Book my uncle Matt. My other family members around the fire got quiet as I replied to him. Stop with the familial relations, I don't care! No! But my uncle did not like this answer and said, What are you, some kind of wussy? Just take some whiskey! I again said, No, I don't want any! My aunt, just to my right, looked at me and said, Come on, Daniel! It's just whiskey! I sat there side dash lintly, angry that an otherwise good night was turning into an awkward situation where my own blood was trying to infect me with a lifelong addiction. I saw what it did to them, and I didn't want that to be me! Ah oh, yes, Onision, yeah, yeah you're, you're totally better than everyone else because you um, abstain from alcohol. Woo. I don't have any alcohol with me at the moment though. My uncle Holler's sitting opposite of me around the bonfire. Here, as he threw the ball to me. I didn't even try to catch the bottle and it smacked against my knee. Immediately, I jumped up and yelled, I said no, why did you have to ruin my night? And before he could respond, I stormed off the bridge to go home. My sister Joanna was in my uncle Matt's house, so she didn't see what happened. Dash it pinned. She didn't hear what they screamed after me as I walked away. And I was so upset, I didn't process what they said after. Full of rage, my whole walk home seemed instantaneous despite the walk, being about a quarter mile in distance. The timely shower I took daily was spent in silence on that night. I just stood there, brewing, staring at the knee that had been impacted by my by the whiskey bottle, my bad. This would only further my frustration with people who drink alcohol. I would have understood if I was at least drinking age, but they didn't care and my mom trusted them. Why? Because family is forever. My head slammed against my pillow. In the shower. Right next to the blaring furnace that heated my entire tiny house. In the shower. The burning gas filled sound was a welcome relief from the disappointment. I felt for my family that night. I knew if I was an adult and saw another adult trying to get a kid to drink alcohol, I'd throw them in the creek at first. <laughs> what? That's kind of extreme, dumbass. And no one did anything. No one defended me. My eyes closed. How could this not get any worse? I thought to myself, not realizing it was not over yet. My dreams owned my sleep and my soul. They were about to take me to a place I had never seen before. Something was very different. I felt a chill to my bones. I woke up in darkness, no longer in my bed. I was in the middle of a massive nothing. No sign of walls, no sign of a room of any kind, just silence. 
I could hear a crackling noise, but it wasn't with my ears. It was like a, a noise you remember, only this was playing in the back of my skull. I went to touch the back of my head when I was interrupted by another non-audible noise. It was a voice, but it was speaking a language I had never heard before. I looked up and saw a warped face. At this point, I knew, enter, I was not in my world anymore. I was in a dream. Despite the warped face now be dash in closer to my eyes than before, it remained hard to make out. Like my eyes were sleepy, causing an intense blur. Only I could see their body clearly, their long, new paragraph, skinny legs, their stick-like arms. I could even somehow see their spine protruding outward and hunched to forward, despite me having no clear sight of their back. In dreams, I can hear things most can't hear. I can see things most can see. That, that's kind of how dreams work, Daniel. I have no explanation cognitive abilities in a sleeping state, okay? The alien, this alien figure spoke what I can only remember as a sharp, aggressive whispers. I was paralyzed, unable to escape, a perfect victim for whatever the creature wanted to do to me. This is what a fly would feel, trapped in a spider web. Only I couldn't even struggle. Lindsay Ellis ripped off. <laughs> This is how Lindsay Ellis got her inspiration for Axiom's End. <laughs> I was paralyzed physically and mentally. The alien graced the back of my neck with his twig-like fingers. He burst both hands down the sides of my face and shortly after lined one finger up with the front of my throat. I began to feel a piercing sensation, but it was accompanied with the sensation brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department that I was being choked as the alien pushed their finger into my neck. I could see from another perspective within the dream that they had submerged half of their finger under my flesh. Ew. As if my soul was outside my body, I could see myself being impaled by this cold gray creature. My eyes turned black as I began to choke up a mud and ash-like paste out of my mouth. Good morning. Good more or orning. Good morning to you. We're happy, so happy, good morning to you, hoo hoo. My mom sang in the most irritating way to get me up every other morning. I looked over my bed rail and there she was with my lunch packed, my backpack in her hand, clearly indicating I was gonna be late for the bus. Time to go to school. End chapter. Jesus Christ, how much longer is this? Chapter three, he had black eyes. The walk to our school bus, the school bus, my bad, was cold. The gravel covering the road up the hill to our stop creaked and crunched under my feet. I didn't understand why I was all dash ready so cold, but I just came from Ohio, a place I only knew for its 90 to 100 D dash gree summers and blazing humidity. Maybe I just lost touch with the place I was born. The cold breeze, the gray skies, the place I knew to be everything became a faint memory after being in Ohio for only a few months, yet it still felt like home. My cousin Michelle was at the top of the hill waiting for the bus as well. Joe Dash Anna remained silent as we walked up. Hi, Michelle, I said as our quarter mile walk came to an end. Hi, Greg and Joanna, Michelle replied. Michelle had her bangs cut in a straight line. She had dirty blonde hair and freckles. She was always kind of a geeky looking kid, but because we were only a year apart in age, we hung out a lot. How long have you been waiting, Joanna asked Michelle. About nine years, it feels like, Michelle replied. The bus came around the corner moments later. I looked to Michelle and said, guess we got lucky with her timing. She a meat dash. Headley replied, shut up. Suddenly the bus exploded into thousands of pieces. What? Meat dash shell was littered from head to toe with sharp and and went flying over the side of the hill. Joanna was screaming in horror from her own wounds and Michelle dolted around spitting up blood and screaming, vacation, vacation now. What? <laughs> Dot, dot, dot. I know, I should apologize. That didn't really happen, but I imagine stuff like that all the time. That's a problem. You should probably see someone about that. The bus pulled up and took us to school, just like I remembered. The smell was the same, the stops were basically the same, and the school itself looked the same. Ocean View Elementary. I'm not sure why it was called that, considering there was no ocean nearby. So I don't see how there could be a view of such a mass dash sieve, but distant mass of water. Some of the teachers were waiting for us as we climbed off the bus. Maybe they just wanted to see what we all looked like, despite having no idea which of us were going to be appointed to each class. The first day of school so far was what I expected, orientation. We met with a curly brown haired lady. She was to be my teacher for every subject the entire year. I had the unfortunate realization that I was going to be in the same class as Heather Simpson. A girl who had hit on me the entire year prior? Mother f 
fucker. She's a kid. Kids just do dumb flirtatious shit. That's just a thing they do. They do, they diddly do. No, no. She would follow me around the halls, out on the playground, everywhere there wasn't a boys only sign. Heather was built like an Amazonian child would be, like only bulkier. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and despite how that sounds, it was a pain to look at. Maybe it was her crooked teeth, or maybe it was her bad breath one could easily smell from many feet away. I feel called out on how I looked when I was nine. <laughs> I'm offended. After a lot of time killing, our teacher finally released us for lunch. Then recess. My favorite activity was to take part in on the playground was the swings. I liked to swing as high as I could, then jump off. There was a ton of sawdust, so I didn't really worry about falling on the ground. Today, I wanted to get further than any of the other kids, so I swung back and forth as hard as I could, but I landed short of the boy next to me, so I tried again. But again, I landed short. Climbing back on, I thought about what happened last night. How angry I was at my uncle. How none of my family was there for me. And I felt like I lost it. A sense of limitations in my body. I swung forward, then backed, repeated in a way I barely remember. And quickly after, I was on the ground, touching the very edge of the border of the swing set area. In other words, I had swung so far, I nearly bashed my head on the pavement just outside the safe sawdust and rectangle floor. Oh my God, Daniel, that was insane. You were like a bird. A voice came from the side of my the playground. It was my friend, David. Oh God. Is it the same David from Stones to Abigail? Imagine if it is the same David from Stones to Abigail. I'm just gonna make it like that. <laughs> this was the first time I had seen him since last year and was I was immediately filled with joy. David, I screamed and ran over to him immediately going for a high five. David returned my excitement and lifted his hand for a mutual high five. I felt a wet splat on my skin and realized I missed a key moment before we slapped hands. He had licked his hand as I lifted mine because Daniel is in will always will be disgusting. He's my friend, but he's disgusting. Gross, David. I yelled and David replied not with words, but with a laugh followed by a snort. David was wearing a yellow and maroon horizontal striped shirt. As usual, he was about two inches taller than me, had darker skin than me, and had his dark hair cut like he didn't have a care in the world. I saw your sister today, Dan Dash Eel. She's hot, David Belch. I replied, can you never say anything like that to me ever again, please? David again started laughing. It was like the guy lived to trigger me. As we tried to catch up, the bell rang for us to come back in. David went for another high five, but I just ran away screaming, no, David. As I walked into the classroom, the teacher announced to us that she had all dash ready gone through all the material for the day. She concluded that we should move on to start one subject of our schooling early so we had more time for a butt dash to fly project in the coming days. The subject we were to cover today was science, more specifically dinosaurs. This is a day I would remember for probably the rest of my life as I was about to see something I had already seen, something I never wanted to see, but had been so forced to experience the sight of again and again. What? My teacher pushed in the VHS, and at first everything seemed normal. It was a generic film about the reptiles that lived on Earth long before humans. No big deal. But the narrator began talking about a concept that no sci real scientific value entered that I could think of. He asked the question, what if a human was combined with a dinosaur? Hearing this, I immediately scoffed. My condescending reaction was muffled quickly by the image they showed after. It was... The alien! They called it a dinosaur human DNA splice, but it was in fact almost identical to what I dreamt of before. The face that haunted my imagination, comma, was realized in the physical world. This was the first time I had seen anything like it with my own eyes. Uh, immediately, I stood up and left the classroom. The teacher didn't remember my name yet, so she yelled after me, um, student? I ignored her and walked to Dashward, the principal's office. I was lost in horror and thoughts of how the rest of the class reacted. I, it was like none of them had seen him before. The alien. Well, again, it's your fucking dream, you idiot. Oh my fucking God. Why was I the only one who seemed upset? Why would they show that to such young kids? Your, your mate, your... You're overreacting, Daniel. Calm the fuck down. Why would they show that 
All right, why would they show that to me? As I walked in the pr to the principal's office, the plump short secretary wearing a tacky flower dress immediately asked me why I was there. Rarely do kids wind up in the principal's office area on the first day. I replied, I need to call my mom. And I did. To my disappointment, but not my surprise, my mom was away at one of her many jobs. I asked the secretary with tears beginning to fall down on my cheeks. Can I stay here until it's time to go home? Secretary saw I was struggling and was and incredibly uncomfortable. So she called the principal out of her office. What's your name? The, said the principal as she slowed in her approach to me. I'm Daniel. I, I just want to wait here till the bus comes and then I want to go home. The tri principal tried to get me to explain what was wrong, but I didn't want to talk about it. They called over to the class and had a student bring me my belongings from the room I abandoned. There I waited till the buses were ready to take me home. I didn't talk to my sister or my cousin the entire walk down the hill. As soon as I got through my bedroom door, I closed it and planted my face in my cheap foam pillow. I was going to wait till my mom got home to say anything. My mom was my safety, the only person I thought could protect me. I relied on her for every dash thing I knew, and if I had anyone I could talk to about it, she was it. That night for dinner, we were having lentils and toast. My mom had put food on the crock spot to cook all day while she was at work. This was common for us as we didn't have a lot of money and food like this was inexpensive. Okay, thank you. I didn't need that explanation. How was school kids? My mom asked all three of us. Christina, my eldest sister, who has suddenly spawned out of nowhere, remained silent while Joanna began her usual rant about every anything and everything involving her outfits, her hair, her friends' appearances, by comparison to her own or anything else involving her reflection. After Joanna was done talking about the most super fit Show of topics, my mom turned to me and asked how I was. Her replied, The teacher showed me a picture of an alien on a video and my and I cried. My mom's face went from curious to angry in seconds. She replied, They showed you a scary alien at your age? I replied, It had dark black eyes and scales. It had no nose, but it had tiny holes where its nose would be, and they said it was a dinosaur human, but it looks like an alien. My sister Joanna laughed and said, Wow, sounds awesome. I frowned and looked at my food hopelessly. My sister regularly seemed like a socio-path to me. Maybe it's you who's the sociopath, Daniel, or the socio-path. I never understand why she thought my sadness was a laughing mat, dashed her. My mom spoke again. Well, I'll have a talk with your teacher. Not even have dashing the emotional strength and odd, I just sat silently looking at my food till it was clear that everyone was done with dinner. After I put my head on my pillow for a final time that day, my fears became re -dashalized. The creature I jumped up before had more strength than ever. He was here now, waiting in the black. Okay, we're just gonna stop it right there. I am now... 17% complete with this um, dumbass book. Can't wait to see what else Greg has up his ass tomorrow. My period came two days early. I blame this book. Anyway, let's continue. Chapter four, hole in the wall. Like, like that game show on Cartoon Network. Remember that game show on Cartoon Network called Hole in the Wall? It had been four months since I saw the distorted alien's face screaming out through to me through the VHS in my class. No shit. We had already completed the butterfly project and were consuming our time with basic math, spelling, and for some reason playing the Oregon Trail on our Macintosh computers. That checks for a public school in this country. David and I have been hanging out most every recess since the beginning of school. Out on the playground, David asked me one day, Hey, can I take the bus home with you? I replied, Yeah, with a little shake in my voice, as I was not sure my mom would approve. As we arrived home, my mom was not there. She was at work, as usual. Then why did you need to care if she approved or not? I'm assuming this was the this was before kids had iPhones. I didn't get my first iPhone until I was 18, you spoiled brats. David would giggle at everything my sister said walking down the wall long gravel road to my house. <clears throat> it was obvious he was basically into every other girl he came in contact with. Michelle would just look at her shoes and kick rocks. She didn't really have much to say to us normally. She was always somewhat of an introvert. Well, that characterization um, contradicts with what you established in the previous chapter, doesn't it? 
Grook. Once we got home, David looked at my bed above the washer and dryer and laughed. Oh my God, that's awesome. I have to share my bunk bed with my brother. You just have to share yours with the whole family's dirty clothes. <laughs> I looked at him sarcastically, not sure if he was seriously complimenting my situation or not. Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. Just then we heard a car pull up outside. Shortly after, we heard a girl laughing and hollering. Bye, Mom. David and I looked at each other. David had a huge grin on his face. It was as if, girls, I love girls, give me girls, 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 was written ear to ear on the kid. Well, he's like 11. I have, has he reached puberty yet? Tween boys tend to be into girls sometimes, okay? That's the normal thing. Joanna went to open the door and said, hi, Mara. David and I stared waiting for this Mara to show her face as the door fray was blocking our view of her. David giggled again as she walked through the door. It was just some random girl with the biggest breasts I had ever seen. Mind you, you're 11. I didn't find her attractive, but David could be heard loudly gulping, so I could only imagine that was his type of thing. The Mara girl, you, you don't have to keep saying that it's this Mara, we know it's fucking Mara, was wearing a neon shirt, blue jeans, had curly brown hair and freckles. She probably isn't what you are imagining as she came off as more of a band geek than anything else. David stared in awe at the girl's breasts till I punched him in the shoulder. He googled and said, what? Sorry. <laughs> and I pulled him back into my tiny room to play video games with me. When my mom got home, she was surprised to see Joanna and I both had friends over. Joanna shared her bedroom with Christina, the, um, the Yeti, and I shared my bedroom with a washer and dryer. So there was no room for anyone to really sleep in a comp dash immunity fashion in either of our rooms. Despite this reality, over dinner, we still slide just just did that my mom let both of them spend the night. My mom agreed that we most all wound up on the front room floor in sleeping bags together. Mara was the only one who slept on the couch. David could not stop obsessing over Mara and her giant breasts. Just gotta say this, when you're a child, you refer to them as your boobies. This was like the height of the I Heart Boobies campaign, right? Get your shit together. But for two dash Natalie, he was also a moron. After everyone turned on the lights, David began loudly building a plot to somehow get Mara and his lips to connect. David said, hey, dare me to kiss Mara to me? And I replied, David, no, because Daniel's a nice guy. He said again more loudly, I'm going to go over there and kiss Mara on the lips. I replied, David, you need to stop being a pervert. Again, Daniel's a nice guy. Yet he did not listen. Giggly, he said, I want to kiss her on the lips. I'm going to do it. Mara then loudly said, um, excuse me? I immediately replied, David, you idiot. The, remove, the room remained silent for the rest of the night. The next morning, we all ate cereal and went on right back to school. Why, why, why did you have a sleepover on a weeknight? Why, why, why? David wore the same clothes as the day before, but he was used to it. Mara had brought clothes from home, hence why her mom had dropped her off. No shit, bitch. At recess that day, Philip, the school bully, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, was waiting for me on the playground. He had given me grief throughout the year, but none so great that it was a huge problem. We would have shown that, but that would have led to character development, which is illegal in an Onision fic. He had curly blonde hair, completely random teeth, as if God himself has thrown his teeth into his mouth like dice, shrugged, then walked away, leaving them where they fell. And as far as Philip's sight, he was about an inch shorter than me. I don't care. Hey, ugly, screamed Philip in my direction. I ignored him. You know I'm gonna beat you down one day, he asked, obviously struggling with however his dad or mom treated him at home. Again, this kid's 11 and he's like talking like Onision's teenage protagonist. What the fuck is wrong with you? I continued to ignore him. I had no interest in making my childhood more screwed up than it needed to be. Off in the distance, just past Philip, I saw a girl, one I had encountered a few times before, but she stood out today more than normal. My mom always taught me to be strong, to say what I feel, and to stick up for myself. This came into play when approaching people I was interested in as well. Walking past Philip as if he did not exist, I approached the girl and said, Hi, I'm Daniel. The girl turned to me and replied, Hi, I'm Aubrey. She was very short, had perfectly straight hair, and bangs cut somewhat like the comma, go figure, Beatles again. Again, Beatles had multiple haircuts throughout their tenure tenure. 
So I don't really understand what you're saying here, Greg. The dark brown haired, pale faced Aubrey, comma, was spending time with a play dash ground with her friend Amber. Amber was blonde haired and super skinny. I don't care. I thought both of them looked so friendly and nice that I wanted to hang out with them more. But the bell had rung and it was time to go in. Well, that was pointless. On my way in, I had noticed that Philip was red faced and enraged. I had ig dash nored him this entire time, but he was a bully. I had no concern, concern with being a so dash seal hero for a bully. Philip had the same class as me now, as he had repeat problems with students in his former class. Philip was clearly upset that day, more than usual, no shit. As the day progressed, he kept interrupting the teacher, and when the teacher finally con dash fronted him about his rudeness, he told her to go F himself, herself, only he didn't say, just say F. We get it. He said, fuck. This is the one time the 11 year old spoke like an actual 11 year old. Fucking hell. He continued to scream at the teacher, throwing a childish tantrum until the teacher, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, decided to call the main office for help, instead of calling the main office for help. It was incredibly awkward seeing the principal herself with an assistant come into the class and drag Philip out of the room. Kicking and screaming, the rest of the class just felt tense and numb after he had left. I could see a small boy in the corner of the room. He was clearly shaking the in dash tire time Philip was screaming and cussing at the teacher. I wondered why. I one dash dirt why? What was going on in this little dirty blonde kid's his head? Was the hair color that important? Okay, little bit of an anecdote. When I was 14 and doing more summer bullshit at a We had to do a project for that particular year. And I decided to write a rather long story about a girl who had childhood onset schizophrenia. It's really bad. It's it's on the internet, but it's really bad. Don't read it. It's bad, bad, bad. And one thing I did was that I, I vividly described the social worker who ended up taking the main character away from her biological parents or her foster parents. I do not 100% remember. But anyway, and one of the comments I got, which will always stick with me was, you can't just keep describing how people look. I remember more about the social worker's appearance than I do about the action that actually happened. It's distracting. And I realized that, oh yeah, that's fucking distracting. So, you know, don't constantly describe people's appearances. That's distracting. I don't give a shit. Only describe them when they're relevant to the plot. Or, you know, insert it in ways that are subtle. You know, it's not that hard. After I got home, the entire night felt different than usual. Seeing someone's life come apart like that, it kind of reminded me how good my own life was. I wasn't happy to see Philip drag out of class, nor the dirty blonde kid shaking in horror dash roar as Philip yelled, but during that whole time I felt confident. My emotions were hearty. I wasn't afraid of Philip, I just felt sorry for him. Sitting alone in my room, I was lost in thought. My imagination consumed my senses. I could see Philip crying, alone in a room, screaming at his father on the other side of the door. Wow, you're such an empath, Greg. I'm so jealous. My imagination seemed more like a ghost, haunting Philip's house. From the top corner of the room, I saw it all. His mother high on drugs, sitting in the front room with only static playing on the teledash vision. The dad flexing his fist, yelling back at Philip through the door. And Philip kicking the door, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, punching the wall, doing whatever he could to make the room he was locked in look how he felt on the inside. This was all just imagination though, dot dot dot. I hope his life is much better than these fleeting thoughts. Let me guess, this is exactly how Philip's life is. Off to my dreams again. Well, that was pointless. Chapter five, face down children. Sitting at the breakfast table in shock. Why am I doing this now? What could have possibly happened? Another nightmare. I wasn't visited by the stick-fingered creek-dashed her. I wasn't dropped into a world that threatened me. 
I looked outside my window, the river running by. I stared, completely losing myself to the effortless flow of water that would take countless men to move so quickly and smoothly without machinery. Maybe this ob observation is pointless. It is. Or maybe we all regularly fail to embrace the true nature of nature. Wow, Gran, you're so deep. You're such a deep boy. Deep. The reality of our reality. We're all impossibly fragile, ready to be taken at any moment. Just like they were taken in the dot, dot, dot. Morning, brat, my sister belted, interrupting my thoughts. Hi, Joanna. How are you? I said back sarcastically. I'm fine. Thanks, dweeb, to reply with skepticism. I hope you have a lovely day, I yelled, using an even more sarcastic tone. She replied, why are you being nice? Did you? The door slammed. I was already on my way to school and didn't have the energy to teach my sister on how to, about how to pick up on obvious social cues. Philip was right back in class that day. He wasn't suspended. He didn't even get detention. Maybe it's because his mother actually is a drug addict and his father was actually an abusive shill and you're such an empath. Daniel, you're such an empath that you were able to predict Philip's life. <coughs> I was surprised because, simply put, I had never in my life seen some Dash One cause so much trouble without getting punished. I think they were leaving him alone because they had already suspended him and made no progress with his B Dash behavior. Morning classes clearly did not help either. Maybe at some point people just accept that there is no fixing someone, so they tolerate them till they have a real X dash excuse to be done with them for good. Like, you know, murder. I didn't want to go out to recess that day, being around Philip on the playground, especially considering his parents had to pick him directly up from the off dash fish the day prior. I only imagine how they responded when they are at home, away from teachers who are more ready to call CPS on parents than call their own families just to check up and say, hi, we want to be heroes and we want to see others fail to make ourselves feel better. Motherfucker teachers are mandatory reporters. That's it, that's the tweet. But I had nothing for, but pity for Philip. He's enter a kid like me, his parents, even his DNA, the results of something less reliable than a coin toss or a roll of dice. Wow, you're bringing in with the deep shit now, aren't you? Aren't you? Aren't you? I heard a whimpering in the back of the room. It seemed while I was lost in thought, a boy had slipped through the door. I asked, What's the matter? The boy responded. The kids outside were to beat me up. They were looking for me, I replied. Why are they wanting to beat you up? Immediately, my hero complex was gain dashing momentum. The boy sniffed for a few seconds and said, They think I'm weak. I'm smaller than them, and they just want to be mad at someone. I looked at him silently. I felt lucky I wasn't below average in height. In fact, I was above, as we established. My mom also taught me how to fight, so I wouldn't be in this guy's position. But it is, as I said, roll of the dice. He couldn't control him winding up in this situation, but I... Next paragraph can. Come on, I said to the boy. He looked confused. I lifted the baseball I got from the recess bin that I now had in my hand. The recess bin, um, I guess spawned out of nowhere. And asked, do you think these guys can play catch? He looked back at me, almost excited by the idea of having the upper hand. What's your name? I asked. The boy had glasses, slicked back hair, and was a little heavy set. He clearly... You're making this so much harder for me than it already is, Groog. He clearly could stick up for himself if he wanted to, but even the smallest people can take on the biggest if they have the right fight in them. And this kid had near none. My name is Aaron, he said. Nice, the heavyset kid who um has the same stylistic choices as Daniel the Himbo. Shares the name of my um, first quote unquote boyfriend. Wonderful. <laughs> I grabbed his shirt saying, let's go, and dragged him out of the door. I headed to the massive field just outside class to confront the now growing crowd of children taunting the air with degrading references to my new friend, Aaron. I approached the group, thinking Aaron was by my side. Do you have a problem with Aaron? I screamed. The group turned toward me. Actually, I just realized. Aaron was a little heavy said, is this just the Aaron I quote unquote dated? <laughs> Fucking hell, what a crossover this is. The group turned toward me. Philip, 
stepped out and said, Yeah, did you see that, Poonk? I realized the hard way Aaron hid behind the fenced electrical boxes just as we left the class. Shaking my dash appointment off, I replied, Yes, and I'm here to let you know that I'm going to kick your teeth in if you mess with him anymore. Let me guess how this is gonna go. Daniel is going to beat the living shit out of Philip and is going to get suspended for a couple days because, you know, he fought a child. That's how it's going to go. That's kind of what happens in every Onision book. Let's find out if that's the case. Just then I heard a scream of, yeah, behind the electrical box. Philip perked up and screamed, he's over there, pointed in Aaron's direction. I screamed even louder while lifting up my hand, cocked and ready to throw the baseball. Make a move, go ahead. Take one step toward Aaron. None of these people knew what a terrible throw I was. And a fucking baseball doesn't really cause that much damage. If you're not a good throw, what the fuck was your idea, dumbass? There was about a one in three chance I would actually be able to hit one of them if I tried, but our human sense of survival regularly demands most of us live in a fashion consumed by fear regardless of the odds. Motherfucker, you're 11. Not even three seconds of silence passed before the bell rang. Immediately, Eve dash rewind began walking into the classroom while Philip remained. Philip didn't care he would get in trouble for ignoring the bell. His eyes were locked on me and I knew Paragraph could see he wanted to hurt me. I dropped the baseball to my side and began walking in. Wow, cool. Good on you for being the bigger man, Daniel. Damn. Back at it again with the white veins. I expected Philip to yell something threatening or offensive after me, but he was silent. I didn't want to look back as I walked into class. I felt the heat on the back of my head as if his eyes were burning into my hair. In class, Philip was completely quiet for the whole second half of the day. I had never seen him like this before. Maybe I made a difference. Maybe the bullying would end. Or maybe it's Maybelline. Or maybe I was being completely gullible and worse things were in store. David was on the bus waiting for me before we headed home, which was strange because his stop wasn't on my bus route. I sat down next to him and asked, so? And he replied, I invited myself over. I hope that's okay. I replied, are you spending the night again? He replied saying he was just coming to my house B- cause no one was home at his house, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. Someone would pick him up later in the day. At home, we did the typical boy things. He would hit on my sister, I would dry heave, and we would play video games. After we got bored with games, I saw my bow and or arrow set sitting in the corner of the room. Hey, David, want to go shoot stuff, I asked. His face lit up, and so he began scanning the outdoors for things to shoot. How about that burn in the tree? He asked with a grin. I replied, I don't want to shoot living stuff. That's psycho. You know, Greg being, Greg's self-insert being the higher person, as usual. Baka. David giggled and said, whatever. I walked off down a little hill to the creek by her house. There were random dead fish that had swam upstream to lay their eggs, then die. I'm not sure why fish work this way. Biology, it's, it's just the way it is, bitch. But they do. By the time their babies are born, their parents are already long dead. Almost like their bodies were symbols, like gravestones, only a marking birth to soon happen, not just a death. Well, that's a pretty long-winded way to say that there are dead fish near your stream. That's probably pollution, dumbass. Immediately, I began plunging arrows into random dead fish in the creek. David screamed with laughter as he came down the hill to see what I was doing. Oh my god, shoot more, he hollered as he snorted. I had gone about seven arrows in the fish before I saw David's mom's SUV drib dashing over our tiny creek bridge. I could see she was rightfully startled at the sight of arrows stricken straight up out of the large dead fish. David ran up the hill screaming, oh, did you see that? <laughs> as his mom came to a stop in our driveway. I was now alone by the water with a smile on my face. David ran back to me to say goodbye. Hey, Daniel, see? I turned to David to see nothing but horror in his eyes. The fish were not alone. Blah, blah, blah. Let me guess, it's Philip. Chapter six, bloody's in the creek. The body was old. Okay, never mind, it's not Philip. There was mold growing on the side of her face. David hadn't spoken to me in weeks. The police came. She was dragged out of our creek and placed in a body bag. Through all this, the alien nightmares continued. Regard dash listed the psychological stress I endured stumbling upon the dead body in my own backyard. They didn't know why there was a dead woman in a skimpy pink dress. Again, relevance. 
laying in our creek. They couldn't explain how she had gone to so long undiscovered, two children finding her body. She was one of three victims. How, how, how did they know there were two more bodies? What? David and I will live with this haunting our childhood forever. They were still looking for her left arm. It seemed it was chewed off by some animal in the woods upstream. I was required to go back to school after 10 days. Half the school knew about what I had gone through, but that didn't change how the key people in my life treated me outside David. I saw Aubrey was on the playground at recess today, so I approached her. I thought maybe she could get my mind off of the clique. Help me escape the memories of the alien sticking his fingers in my neck and torturing me every other night. Hi, Aubrey, I said, trying to smile. Aubrey replied, hi, Daniel, with a smi slight smile as well. She had learned a bit about me through her friend, Amber. Amber was an observer who liked to learn things about people, most everyone she was around. Brought to you for no reason whatsoever. I suppose it made her feel more secure, which I'm sure has its own re dash sense and story. I was wondering if you wanted to go with me sometime, I said. Aubrey re dash plight, go with you? Just then Amber walked up to Aubrey and said, Hi, Daniel. I looked up and said hi back, only to connect eyes with Aubrey again. I mean, go out on a day like the mall. Aubrey looked at her feet and said, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you, I think. Amber jumped in saying, she have to ask her parents and gave me a big smile. In the corner of my eye, I could see a figure standing there, staring at me. It was <gasps> Philip. Looking over, I could see he was angry. Clearly, he didn't care about what I had gone through recently. He hated me just as much as before, and after my brief time away from school, obviously just wanted to continue where he left off. The field. The ball in my head. A threat I made for the sake of defending someone else. Aaron. The rest of recess, I decided to spin in the basketball court, trying to jump off the wall and grab the hoop. Myself and a few other people were having fun doing it. Finally, we don't get to hear about the hair colors of these dudes. Thank Christ. And only I was able to actually grab on every other attempt as I was the tallest, no shit, as well as the best jumper. The bell rang and we were off to class. Before class started up again, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, a teacher approached me and whispered an apology about the half dinosaur, half human she had shown me on the first day of school. It's been months since that, dumbass. What the fuck? What the fuck? Like, you're just getting a half-ass apology now? That's stupid. That's fucking dumb. Apparently, I was not the only one who complained, and that gave me a sense of relief. The ride home from school was lonely. Joanne was off at some extended extracurricular activity, and of course, David was coping with being the first of us to see the body. Michelle didn't talk much as usual, so it was mostly just me alone with my thoughts, not exactly where I wanted to be. When I got home, I looked for my papa, but he was nowhere to be found. As I looked for him, I heard booming laughter in the distance outside. The sound came from my neighbors, which happened to me by grandpa and grandma's house. So I walked down the gravel road to see who was so happy. As I got closer, I could see my papa talking to my uncle Ben. He always got along with my mom's side of the family, maybe even more so than my mom. They would ride motorcycles together, go fishing together, and shooting as well. Okay. Hi, Papa, I said. My stepdad replied, Hey, Daniel, come here, for exclamation points, and ran up to hug me. I left, and after a brief glance, my Uncle Ben just looked back to what he was working on in the shop they were in. After my Papa hugged me, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, I moped around outside the shop until I saw a flower. I bent over and picked the flower, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, only to hear, well, that won't grow back to seven years. It was my uncle. He was pointing out I had just ruined something rare. I didn't know how to react, so I just said sorry. My uncle just shrugged and went back to work. Now feeling stupid, I decided I would just walk home again and play video games in my room. My mom didn't make dinner that night. Joanna went straight to her room once she got home, and I was happier left alone, silently tapping away at my game con dash troller, lost in the world of Final Fantasy VII. The next day at recess, I went to check on Aubrey to see if she had asked her parents about going on a date. When I approached Aubrey, right to you at the Department of Redundancy Department, she seemed happy to see me, but as I began to ask her, Philip! <gasps> approached me from behind. I would keep trying to ask Aubrey if she talked to her parents, but Philip kept interrupting his statements like, you have a problem with me? And what are you, wuss? You have a problem? I could see Aubrey was getting upset with Phil Dash and banging, barging in on our otherwise peaceful interactions. So I asked Aubrey calmly, would you like me to get rid of this guy? She hesitated to respond, but I could see our lives would both be better without Philip. Yeah, keep you back turned to me, you pathetic loser. 
Philip screamed at the back of my head as I faced Aubrey. I then sat and said to Aubrey, <laughs> this will just take, this will take just a moment. Ah, finally, Philip is going to get attacked by the Onision stand-in. As if this doesn't happen in every Onision book. Using everything my mom taught me about fighting and the anger I felt for Phil Dash Lip, messing with the connection I felt with Aubrey, I began slinging my fists as fast as I could at Phil's face. I did so in a way that me even turning to him in the first place to begin punching him would just be a blurry memory to him. The only thing Philip knew to do was to try and grab my shirt as I was still punching his face and pull me to the ground. As I fell to the ground, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, he made the mistake of not pushing me away from him. So I continued, from the sitting position to rapidly punch him in the face as he was forced to bend forward, having not yet let go of my- Me shirt! Of my shirt, my bad. After a few punches from me on the ground, he fell over, releasing my shirt, and began screaming as he cried. One of the staff assigned to watching kids on the playground was also scream dashing in horror as she caught the tail end of our fist fight. We were both taken to the principal's office, but at the time I didn't understand why I was even in trouble. You attacked a child. That's why you were in trouble, you dumbass. The entire way to the office, I was asking questions like, Why am I in trouble? He was bullying to me! While Philip screamed, He was bullying me like a machine! Philip and I were placed in chairs next to each other in the office. I was in the same chair the day I walked in after seeing the dinosaur-human hybrid months prior. Fucking hell. Philip was sniffling and wiping now drying tears from his face at this point next to me. He had a tissue the staff had given him to help him deal with everything coming out of his nose and eyes. After waiting for our parents to show up for about 30 minutes, under his breath, Philip said, You know I could beat you up if you didn't jump me like that. I smiled and replied, Okay, Philip. Okay, Boomer. He continued, You're still a wuss, you know. I smiled again. Sure, Philip. Philip awkwardly laughed and sniffed quite a few times more. That was the last interaction I'd ever have with him before he died weeks later. Excuse me, what the fuck? Chapter 7. The Eyes of Death. The creek was becoming the monster of my backyard. I learned one day in school after Philip and I fist fought that he was on his sled by the creek far up dash stream from me and for some bizarre reason thought it was appropriate to slide down a hill that ended in the icy water which heavily flowed this time of year. Oh, so uh, we're just gonna skip straight on to Philip's day? Okay then. David was the one who broke the news to me. It was a fact that served as a silk dash ver lining on the ripped and burnt pages in the book of my social life. David avoided me before as a result of death and began talking to me again as a result of death instead of, you know, being traumatized twice over like a normal human being. Neither of us could understand how Philip died as no one would tell us about his death beyond the fact that it was a sledding accident that ended in the creek. Um, gonna guess right now that he was murdered. David and I discussed theories after our initial shock. Were there no other sled? Were dash the hills around? Did he have something blocking the creek so he wouldn't slide right in? Maybe that was blocked, but maybe what was blocking him from winding up in the creek had fallen over after he failed to stop on his own short of the homemade safety precaution. Maybe as a result of that, he found himself being taken away by the heavy ice dash cold current. Maybe that current led him to a gathering of logs and assuming he had not already drowned, he was sucked under the logs, causing him to rapidly cease existing in the world as we knew it. Remember, this child is 11. My mother wanted me to stay home for a week once I told her the news, but more importantly, she also wanted me to stay away from the creek indefinitely. Rightfully so. There have been murders in there! My papa didn't have much to say about it, and my sister Joanna was so obsessed with the relationship she was in while this all happened that it was like no one died at all to her. Does she even know who Philip is? Does she even know people got murdered in the creek? Well, probably, but she probably just doesn't care. It was bedtime. I was still dealing with this news of Philip's death that was um, announced to us prematurely last time, and now uh, I was expected to sleep. I thought I wouldn't be able to, but the hum and warmth of the furnace behind my head and the washer below rocking the chains of my bed I was attached to, I couldn't resist, you know, it, it, 
in case you thought the chains were attached to his body. I couldn't resist slipping right back into the black hole room I had dreamt of so many times before. The alien was waiting for me. I felt I had come to know him almost as well as a human can know an alien they're being abducted by. Once the fear subsided, I started to notice the creature ticked his head to the side every so often. He would make a click sound when he did this, almost like a kid I saw in my school in the special ed group sitting across from me at lunch in the cafeteria a couple weeks back. I noticed that kid a few times prior at school, but he ticked the constantly when trying to eat his homemade ham sandwich. Brought to you for no reason whatsoever. The alien's breath smelled like a swamp and it felt and felt like I was coming from a wind dash dough being opened up on our, to a fresh snowy day. I could tell the alien blinked some dash times, but his eyelids were transparent. Despite the creature having no indication in it is eyes alone as to where it was looking. I could tell because when I, what, it wasn't react dash teen to a tick, it would tilt its head to the side slightly and often stare in an obvious manner in my direction. Almost like the alien was constantly lost in deep thoughts about me or daydreaming with no thoughts at all. Do you mean oblivious there, man? Fucking hell. I'm not sure what the alien thought was so special about me. I don't understand what was worth studying night after night, but this would be me assuming the alien was even real. I don't understand how a creature like that could even bring me to it considering how tiny my room was. You know, cause it, it's a dream. It's a dream. Don't you know that you're dreaming? Oh wait, yeah, you're 11. Never mind. Keep forgetting that because this sounds like Onision's teenage protagonists. <sighs> Even more remarkably, tiny my bedroom window was, and really the only thing that I could imagine was the alien would, beyond my comprehension, break down my physical body, so I could somehow be transported through the very roof over my head, a roof of no. Attic as it was flat and low quality at that. Brought to you for no reason whatsoever. Come to think of it, in this dream I could hear the rain outside hitting the thin roof a few feet away from my ears. This meant I was still partially awake. Maybe had more power than I knew. I thought to myself, I hate it when people say that they think to themselves. Where else are you gonna think? Are you gonna think to the tree? Are you gonna think to the wall? Are you gonna think to your stuffed animals? No, you always think to yourself. It's fucking redundant. Stop saying that. I thought to myself for a moment and then screamed at the alien, let me go, now! The alien looked at me. I was laying, paralyzed vertically in front of him with seemingly nothing supporting my upright body, especially not my own muscles. The alien chattered to itself as if it was laughing at me. I screamed again, let me go! And immediately a metal clank sounded off in the distance. The black empty distance behind the creature brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. The alien looked back briefly, analyzing the sound behind it. It then turned to me and immediately began charging me. I screamed one last time, no more, as I glared directly into it is glossy dark eyes. The alien jolted in his head back and emitted a vibration from it is entire body as what appeared to be fluid ejected from one of its eyes. It is eyes, my bad. Immediately my body shot backward, making the alien look like just a speck in I, only a few seconds. Now frozen in complete blackness, I stood there like a puppet being controlled by an unseen master. Suddenly a sinking feeling overwhelmed my body and stars appeared all around me. I began to realize the alien could tell I was waking up, not in the dream, but in reality. The alien charged at me because it had to rapidly inject me again, so I would not see where I was, how far I was from home. Lindsay Hillis ripped off this book to write axioms and <laughs> The entire earth sat thousands of miles beneath my feet. As I gazed out upon it, the entire planet grew larger as I began to understand I was indeed not in my physical body at any point in that black room. It was my soul the entire time and my soul was running home. The perfectly square roof of my house was just a dot within a massive green wilderness surrounded by a Tiber neighborhood. I could see the racetrack. I could see the railroad. I could. See the creek. Everything appeared as I imagined it would be. Only the creek had red marks distributed seemingly randomly up and down it. They glowed like a cat's eyes glow. Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. When shine a flashlight on them in the night. I didn't understand what these marks on the creek were, but I was already assuming what it could be. Then what could it be? 
I blinked as I fell a few hundred feet more, and when I opened my eyes, I saw myself laying there. As I hovered above my body, I began to wonder how I could possibly return. Do I just lay inside myself and mumbled around? Somehow sensing me, my body twitched and then opened its eyes. It is eyes. Do I just lay inside myself? My body had repeated my words. Exactly. <gasps> I turned around and tried to lay down, but nothing happened. A clock radio reading four o'clock near my bed was making a static noise, so I moved over to try and turn it off. My hands slid right past the off switch and I could feel the electricity and dash terrain dot 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 wherever I was. I jumped back, landed in the middle of my body in response to the electricity and felt my physical self chilled up, smacking my head against the ceiling that was so incredibly close to the bed anchored right above the washer and dryer. Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. Ow! Damn it! I screamed. The furnace was still blaring. No one would have any idea what was going on in my room. There was no way I was going back to sleep, so I slid down the ladder to my bed, put on a cartoon-covered bathroom, and immediately walked to the massive windows in my front room to look for at least one of the marks I saw in the creek while I was falling. I wish I could tell you I saw nothing, because I would rather this have been simply a twisted and life-haunting dream, which it probably is. I... I don't want to talk about this right now. Chapter 8 SHOCK Daniel! A voice came from the side of my head. Daniel! Hey! The voice moved outward. I could hear it more clearly now. Daniel! Wake up, dude! The voice rang again. One side of my face feels cold. My arm is covering my eyes. My head is on my desk. I'm in class again and... David? Hi, David, I said, slowly pulling my head up from my slumber. Why are you sleeping instead of playing on the playground? David asked. No new paragraph. This is wrong. I smiled sleepily and replied, I haven't been sleeping much at home. I've had a lot of bad dreams. I think my house is haunted or something. David frowned slightly and said, It's the creek! I shook my head and smiled. No, it's, it's a lot more than that. The heater, the washer, the dryer, the water heater... Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. The flat roof making it easy for abductions. God, what the fuck is going on? I don't even know what's going on anymore. David made a weird face. I wasn't sure if he was about to start laughing or psh, ha 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 ha, he burst out. Yep, he was laughing. Immediately I began laughing too. Not because I was trying to be funny, but because he had no, he had period, no idea that I was Siri dash us. David's laughter wound down as he said, come on. Let's go outside! And I nod dash did, following him rapidly. As we played on the after we played on the swings and the monkey bars a bit, I noticed a small glow down a hill by the playground that led to the soccer field. I slowly made my way there, but was somewhat afraid that it might that would it, that it would lead me to the same thing I suspected I'd see the other night. David, wanna play kickball? I asked. Yeah, but we have no f David re dash lied. Yeah, but we have no friends. I giggled and said, we have plenty of friends to play with. I have two and you have two, see? Then I wiggled my legs in front of him as if they were separate people. David shouted, you're so weird. I hate you. Ha ha ha. And we ran down the hill to get into the bag of balls the teacher set on the field for us. Whenever David kicked the ball for me, I would move slowly toward the other end of the field. Are we really getting into this kickball bullshit? Fucking hell, everyone knows how kickball works. There was a met where there was a metal fence surrounding the school property. It allowed me to get closer to the red glow. Every time he would kick the soccer ball past me, unwillingly allowing me to approach the red glow to see what it is, and also not tip David off that anything was different about me. All right, here goes my biggest kick ever. You're probably going to die if you get in the way, David yelled. I hollered back, try me. David ran up and kicked the ball extremely hard. Normally his aim is really bad, but this time he got lucky and he smacked me right in the middle of my face. Immediately my nose began to bleed before I even hit the ground. David screamed, oh my god, Daniel, as he began to run toward me. As I rolled to my knees, I grabbed my shirt and pressed it to my nose, trying to stop the blood flow out of my face. Right in front of my eyes, the red glow burned as I found myself forgetting about my injury and lost myself to curiosity. Slowly standing, I walked forward to the glow. David slowed his run behind me, wondering why I was acting so strange. No shit. I wasn't crying. I wasn't saying anything. I was just silently walking away from him toward the woods for what I'm sure he and Ash aging had no reason for it. Daniel, want me to get the nurse, David said. I replied, I I'm fine, come here, David said nervously. Uh, I'm gonna get the nurse. And ran off in the op dash posit direction. I don't think the old David would have done that, but I think he was getting the same weird feeling he got before when he found the dead bodies in the creek. No shit, Sherlock! He wasn't wrong to run away. About 10 meters into the shadow of the woods, I could see a deer with everything below the ribs ripped clean away. That was the glow, just like I saw in the creek, the glow was death. That's 
traumatizing to say the least. The bell rang off in the distance, but I didn't really care much about the rules anymore. The glow of the remains of this deer faded in my eyes as if my mere presence had put the deer's soul to rest. Or maybe I just had some god-given gift to help me locate the dead and it only lasted till it could confirm each location to identify those fallen. What the legit fuck? What the f That would not be the, um, assumption I would have made at 11. Okay, maybe, but, um, it's still not a correct assumption. Daniel, I have the nurse! I heard a desperate David screaming behind me. I turned and smiled with blood gushing down my face. I could feel the blood seep dashing through my teeth. As It was as if I zoned out entirely on the deer, grunting the end dash tire time. I felt a cold metal smack against my head. I had lost consciousness and fallen against the fence that separated the kids from the woods. I woke up to the sound of crying. It was David and I was now in the nurse's room. More than one nurse. David was talking to my mom. He kept saying he was sorry for knocking me out with a soccer ball, but all I could hear my mom trying to reassure him, letting David know that I had a history of passing out and it wasn't him. Fact is, I had a heart condition, or so I thought I did. But every doctor I went to could not identify what the problem was or if there even was a problem. Whenever the doctors tested me, I wouldn't pass out or have heart pains or anything. So of course on paper I'm perfectly healthy. For all I know, it could have been the mere sight of blood on my own shirt. I couldn't handle a half-human, half-dinosaur. Why would I be able to cope with my face flushing blood? I'm sorry, David! I yelled, trying to get him to stop crying. Oh, Daniel, you're not dead! David says, sounding like he was full of joy. It sparks joy. My mom stood up and said, How many times do I have to tell you to put pressure on your nose the moment you stop bleeding? I replied, Thanks, Mom. I'm fine. Can we go home? My mom shook her head and held up my backpack. You know I have to go back to work after I drop you off, right? Now I have to work late, she said. I read Dash Plight. I'll try not to bleed myself unconscious next time. My mom sighed, hope dashfully getting my implied point and drove me home. As I stood in the door and watched my mom drive back over a little creek bridge to go to work, I realized it was only 1 p.m. and I had still had around three hours B-4 my sister or anyone else got home. I don't know what got into me, but I had the overwhelming urge to get a closer look at their way. You know, what are those top 10 things you think before death? I ran halfway toward the water before I remembered I was highly prone to passing out and should probably get some calories in my body for energy. No shit. Running back inside, I grabbed a bag of marshmallows and sprinted down the hill to begin my investigation. The first clue I found was a fish that was smashed under a rock. It had clearly been dead for some time. Walking up the side of the creek, I found another dead animal. It was a rabbit that had most of its, it is body eaten, clearly by both insects and probably coyotes. Gross. Finding these dead creatures felt a lot like Easter egg hunting, only the eggs didn't glow like these bodies did. It was easier than any hunt I'd experienced speed dash for, and nowhere near as lighthearted, and probably very traumatizing. For about 30 minutes, I kept finding small animals. I even found a cat, only it was just a skeleton. I was surprised that the bones would still glow after all that time being dead, but they did. Clouds started gathering overhead and rain began to fall. I decided I would search just a little bit more, the go home. My goal was to clear out everything around my house. I didn't want to be able to see any glowing from where I lived. It would be a constant reminder of death, and sometimes you just don't want to think about that. The bodies were so repetitive as a result of the carnivores animals in the area we lived. I mean, that's in every area. We didn't get bears much or really any large predators, so the body I approached last, the size, it didn't make sense. Back in the woods of my school, where I saw the deer that was miles from my home and directly connected to a far deeper forest misspelled than what surrounded my home. Railroad tracks, a racetrack, a busy road, all neighboring this little canyon that my whole family lived in. So what was a large dead body doing here? No coy dash OD would kill something that big. As I approached, I saw antlers. It was a male deer. I went through that entire preliminary thought process pointlessly. Maybe a bear did cross over, or maybe this deer died of a disease. Looking more closely at the deer, I began to see a wiggling in Ida's neck. I wasn't touching it, nor was I doing anything to it outside running away in horror. The red glow faded on the deer, and that was good enough. Slipping across the rock and sometimes sliding in the water, I eventually made it home. Covered in mud and feeling 100% done in the creek for the time being. Thank God. Chapter 9. Eyes never open. Spring break had come. 
Finally, we're getting somewhere. I was sitting in my room below, looking at my old TV. The beautiful imagery of the Final Fantasy VII glowed in front of me. The characters all looked like hip young adults, something I desired to be. Everyone in your fan base knows what Final Fantasy VII is, you fucking idiot. Why? Being a child felt so endless like waiting for a Christmas that was never going to come. I had already in dash vested or about 24 hours to combine gameplay into this game brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. I planned on spin dashing my entire spring break in my room pinned between the dresser and the wash dashing machine playing Final Fantasy VII. After a couple of days of my mission, after a couple of days, my mission of complete isolation appeared to be success dashful until my mother called me out to help her make dinner. She said, I'm having a friend come over today. And I replied, have I met this friend, mom? My mom and dashed No, this is a friend I had met recently at work. She's very fragile, so be nice to her. Okay, Daniel? Scuffing, I replied, mom, I think you're mistaking me for Joanna. She's the rude one. I'm the quiet one who never gets in anyone's busy dashness. My mom laughed as she continued to clean dishes together and the sink seemed dashingly incoherently. After I cleared off the table and my mom had finished making our meal, we heard a knock on our large, thick, rustic looking wooden door brought to you for no reason whatsoever. My mom introduced her to everyone in the house saying her name was Cynthia. Right away I could see she was pregnant, but out of my childhood, why would I point out this specific story? The pregnant woman who is a friend of my mom. I was just talking about dead animals and suddenly I'm talking Talking about a pregnant woman. Stop it with your self awareness, you dipshit! It's not cool or a good way to write shit! Stop! Well, it's not hard to figure out. Cynthia was in fact fragile. Throughout all of dinner, I could see that she was emotionally distraught. She would say everything as if she was about to break down crying any moment. And I had already figured out completely why. This woman was trying to hold off going to the doctor. She seemed like such a nice lady, but that wasn't a very nice thing to do. She was trying to hold on to the baby inside of her. She was trying to ignore reality. You can see when a woman has a baby that's alive and well inside of her, there would be no reason for me to see any up the dash collusion or otherwise hallucinate with whatever gift I was given by the alien radi dash lady from any section of her body. Yet this woman's belly glowed. I imagine it would have glowed yes less yesterday and maybe this week there was no glow at all. As I listened to this woman talk, I began to realize that her avoiding the doctor wasn't a result of anything except for financial hardship, instead of learning that it's anything but financial hardship. It didn't take long conversing with my mom for her to break down in front of all of us talking about how she didn't have health insurance so that the baby had stopped kicking days ago. Oh no. This is going exactly where I think it's going, isn't it? After some convincing, my mom finally got her to agree to go to the ER with her. Seemingly without hesitation, a selfish thought crossed my mind. You ever see? You see, ever since I gained this ability, I had planned to avoid it. Wow, how cool, how selfless of you, Daniel. Curiosity caught the best of me one day, but it was a necessary curiosity to help avoid future incidences of me investigating or being reminded of my ability. I searched the creek to get a red to rid myself of the constant red glow I would see outside my window just by passing on a normal day. This walked right into my front room and now unforgivable thoughts centered on myself crossed my mind. Spring break is ruined. Now I have to think about a dead baby, I said to my dash self. And I cursed myself for having such a thought as if I was the victim, as if me losing my happiness in a simple break from an otherwise relatively happy element dash cherry school experience was really the true problem here. Boy, it goes on in your mind often defies much of your future. And then that night, I'd to find my own feud dash her. Brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. The rest of that week, I did in fact spend weighed down by a cloud of doom over my head. Multiple times throughout my break, I asked my mom what happened to that woman and whatever I asked, my mom simply said that she didn't want to talk about it. That just made the cloud over my head grow darker. On the first day of school back, I saw David again. Selfishly, I stared with David what happened to that poor woman, how it happened right in front of me, and he, of course, was not happy whatsoever to hear this information. Like, dude, they just, you, you just got back from a week long vacation. They, they don't want to hear about the miscarriage your mom's coworker had. This was basically the only conversation I had with David that day. He was just the kind of kid to avoid problems and sometimes that means avoiding people who bring prob dash blimps to you. I understood it, but I didn't respect it. For some reason, watching the short brown and as he walked away, triggered a sudden realization in me, that boy who reminded me of the alien. 
hadn't seen him in a very, very long time. He's dead. The kid who was in special ed class, who I would see sitting across from me during lunch once in a while. He did stash appeared right around the same time I fought back at the alien. He dead. But how would I ask about who he is to anyone? Walk up to a teacher and said, hey, you know that special ed kid who twitches funny? Have you seen him around? No, I don't think I could do that. The moment you even mention a special ed kid, they even they immediately consider you writing up for a hate crime, it seems. Are you trying to compensate for something here on you, boy? Cause this ain't subtle at all. Aubrey, however, was still around. We just kind of fell apart after the whole Phil Dash lip incident. I mean, how do you recover with someone after you beat someone up in front of them and then that person just happens to die from an accident not long after? What's the opening statement and a reintroduction there? Hey, remember Dash Burr that time I beat up that kid who's dead now anyway? What were we talking about? No. For me, school was becoming more and more lonely every day, and even that kid I saved from bullying. He was only talking to me at the time because I was the person that would save him from his troubles, and now he needed no more saving. It was like I was a ghost to him, too. Oh my god, I feel so bad for you, Greg and Sir Wild. Regardless, it's time to go home again. That same school bus. That same driveway, that same time of the day, same house, the same bedroom, the same phone pillow, flip out the lights, Daniel, and now you're dreaming again. And what dream am I going, am I going to have now? Oh yeah, that's right, dot, dot, dot. The same dream. <gasps> the same dream? <gasps> My sleep schedule's whack, I'm tired as heck, and now Reaper's Creek is back. Chapter 10, Your Dead Girlfriend. The alien was prepared this time. He pulled one of my eyes out. Sorry, what? I tried to scream. My mouth was stuck open. My vocal cords were paralyzed. With my re dash meaning eye, I tried to get a good look at the alien as I yelled inside my own mind, suffering silently to the world around me. The alien looked healed. Maybe it was a different alien whose eyes didn't explode, but it seemed this one was trying to take an eye for an eye. Da, 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 no, da, 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 he, it, whatever it is, put my eye back. But it felt different. My eye felt a warmth at the stem. Do I have stems? Hey Siri, do, do I have stems? Okay, I found this on the web for do I have stems. Check it out. It just gave me a few articles about stem cells. The alien reached forward and pulled my other eye. With seemingly no resist dash tints, I could see with my freshly replaced eye in seemingly the same way. No blur. 2020, or I guess just 20 vision. After inspecting and touching my eye in a few areas, it was also returned to my head. The creature seemed to be in a hurry. Immediately, it thrust it his hand into my chest and pulled out my heart. Or so it looked like my heart. I have no real understanding of my own anatomy. Blame the American education system there, Daniel. I screamed in my head again. I knew the alien could hear me. I must have looked like a fool with my mouth stuck open and enough dashing coming out. Just standing there frozen, a gaping hole in my chest. I lost calm dashishness. A happy voice. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Too. Shut up, mom. I screamed abruptly coming up out of my sleep. Greg. Okay, his name's Greg again. It's not Daniel anymore. It's Greg. <laughs> Fucking hell. It's just much more obvious that this is a self-insert. <laughs> Fucking hell. Greg, don't talk to me like that, my mom yelled back, only to be interrupted again. Mom, my chest is bleed dashing. I yelped. Immediately, my mom ran out, grabbed my papa, and before I knew it, we were in the urgent care facility waiting for a doctor to decide if I'm worth his or her time. He actually is bleeding? Fuck. I blinked out completely in the truck right there. So much of my life felt unfathomable now. Why was I being tortured? What the, did the alien do to me this time? And who could I tell about this without being sent to a mental institution? Ha <laughs> ha, Daniel. Okay, it's Daniel again. Your fa you are face is turning green, my sister Joanna. Take a shot. Oh, wait, no, this isn't Crystal Smith's terrible fan fiction. This is Onision's terrible fan fiction about himself. Just did across from me in the waiting room. She could make fun, but we both know she wouldn't have come with my mom 
comma, and Papa, unless she was also concerned. I just glared at my sister and rolled my eyes in a slightly amused manner. I wasn't in much pain. I just didn't want to ignore a chest wound for the sake of common sense. I got to the doctor's examination room after sitting in the waiting room for four hours. I guess chest bleeding wasn't a huge priority to them. Thank you, American healthcare system. After an additional 30 minutes of waiting, a nurse came in, asked me a bunch of mundane questions and left. Another 15 minutes and the doctor came in. He lifted on my shirt and scoffed, then left the room after a few generic comments about my sleep behavior and even gave me a speech about self-harm. I was confused about all this, but he beat dash came clear. He had concluded I had done this to myself, either consciously or undash consciously. The wound on my chest had already dried and no stitches were required at Dash, apparently, the alien had done either a great job making it look like I hurt myself, or a bad job simply cleaning up my wound entirely. I mean, it stuck in his fingers through my skin before without a mark, so why did it leave a mark this time? Because the alien was lazy. Ah, fuck. As we left the urgent care, my sister indicated that she wanted to drive. My mom laughed at the idea as she was nowhere near old enough yet. My papa re dash main in our truck the entire time we were inside. Apparently, he, he died of, um, heat stroke. Apparently, while I was getting looked at, he got fish and chips. I helped myself to chips. Everything on the road, boom, seemed normal. My head was leaned on the back passenger window out of boredom. My sister was on the other side of the back seat, asleep in, on her window. Everything felt so typical till we pulled off on the main road into, onto our gravel road. From seemingly nowhere, a man in a small black pickup truck collided with the middle of our truck. Me being immediately on the other side of the door he t-boned, I flew back and full-on slammed against my sister. Finally, something's happening, except I'm not excited. There's gonna be a cop out. My mom's window shattered and my papa was completely unaffected aside from a few pieces of shattered glass shaping his face as I flew past him. Without hesitation, the man who hit us, clearly in a day, screamed at us to see if we were okay. But despite how hard he hit us, we were not the people he should have been concerned with. No one else seemed to notice it, but his girlfriend, or whoever she was, who sat in the passenger seat of his car, was clearly dead. She did not glow to my eyes. That ability was clearly gone. But I felt a cold in her that I did not feel about anyone else around me. I didn't realize it till this mo dash meant. Maybe it was because I surrounded myself with the living and there was no inconsistency that stood out in this new sensation. Yet in my chest, when I looked at the woman slammed against the back truck's dashboard, I felt nothing but side dash lint. Still, cold. Are you okay? Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Where did you come from? Oh man, God. The man yelled at us in our large orange vehicle as we all recovered. It's a truck, by the way. It's an orange truck. In case that wasn't obvious already. My papa looked back to me. Daniel, are you hurt anywhere? I replied, my chest is bloody again, but I think I just ripped the scab back open. Meanwhile, Doe Jess Anna was sitting there wailing in horror. Ow, my ear, she screamed. Uh, dash, apparently a piece of glass had somehow found it is way into her ear canal. Ew, fuck. Ew, no, no, ew, no, ew. Disclaimer, I can be a little squeamish. Let me help you, I'm sorry, screamed the man outside our shattered white window. I yelled back, dude, your girlfriend is dead. Worry about her. Rude. I felt the focus of most everyone involved suddenly shift to me in a horribly uncomfortably way. The driver of the black truck muttered confused under his breath and looked back at his girlfriend. He saw she was hunched forward and began screaming her name. My family kept looking back and forth at me, then at the man in the little black truck trying to wake his girlfriend up. I muttered, she's not going to wake up, she's dead. My mom replied, Daniel, we get it. My papa added, you guys should walk home. I'll deal with the police and, any and everything. You know, instead of like calling the paramedics because, uh, you know, your children are injured. <laughs> None of us were in the mood to deal with any more waiting rooms or doctors that day. We walked down the gravel hill to our home to self-medicate. That night over dinner, my papa was looking at me funny. I asked, what's up, papa? He replied, how did you know that woman was dead? I answered, I, did she look dead? My papa answered me, no, she looked unconscious. Unconscious can be similar to dead sometimes. Deal with it. I looked down at my plate. Oh, God, no, he's saying the alien shit. Ah! I was abducted by an alien, dot, dot, dot. I've been abducted a lot, dot, dot, dot. I think they put stuff inside me, dot, dot, dot. I think I can do things, dot, 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 or nothing.
things now. Then Papa immediately rolled his eyes and laughed to himself. As you should, that's stupid. When you want to tell me what was going through your head, why you sound so confident? Come let me know, okay? He said as he stood up and gave his food to our dog. I let out a sigh. That was the re exact reaction I expected. I followed up my last statement with, that was the chest wound I had. I think they ripped my heart out and I don't know. My papa replied from a distance now as he closed the bedroom door. Okay, good night, Daniel. I looked back at those remaining at the dinner table. My sister was staring at me. What? Joanna replied. You're an idiot. Someone died in your joke dash ing around? I let a big sigh reply. You're right. I'm an idiot. Weeks later, I discovered something new about myself on the playground. Some dash thing that probably ruined a few people's lives. I'll talk about it later, though. You know, in case he thought there was going to be any more plot. There's going to be no more plot. Chapter 11. Awake! Months passed. I was laying in bed, looking at the wood poles bracing the top of my ceiling. Why was I alive? Why were any of us alive? Motherfucker, you're 11. Stop being so existential. Why was my existence so dash rounded by death? Why was I given the ability to know automatically when death was near me? A few weeks back, one of our teachers had a heart attack in the middle of class. No students were being noisy or anything. Many people act like you only get high heart attacks when someone surprises you or you're exercising. Mr. Lucas died right in front of his fifth grade class and he wasn't even standing up. Just died in his chair and it took the class around a half hour to notice. Across the building, I felt him die. The absence of warmth haunted me many walls away. I could even tell you what his soul looked like if I closed my eyes. Yell dash low. It glowed. It was hollow on the inside. It had a tail, like a neon sea creature, if anything. Daniel, turn out your light! My mom shouted from the front room. I was so sick of being tormented by things beyond most anyone's comprehension, let alone the fact I'm just a kid. You know, that's why I'm being so existential, like the high school protagonist Greg has also written. <laughs> How am I supposed to be functional, even remotely sane, in an environment that seemingly constantly reminds me of the worst part of life? One that throws it in my face even if I run. What happens if I go to sleep? Will I get abducted again? Yes. Mom, I'll turn off the light in a minute, I yelled back. My mother wasn't interested in anything but absolute compliance. Her con stash spent working, dealing with the people she encountered every day, it made her head strong, and willing to budge for most anyone, especially me. You go to bed now or you're in trouble, my mom followed back. I replied, oh, what are you going to do? This is gonna be a painful experience for everyone involved. I replied, oh, what are you going to do? And my mom immediately slapped her belt against my door. As the belt impacted, I could hear the cheap wooden door creak as if it had been dented from the outside. No shit. I screamed again, so you're going to hit me. Go ahead and beat me then, mom. I don't care. I just want the light to be on. Leave me. As I screamed, I heard a subtle noise, sun dash toll noise, my bad, that I don't even know how to describe. I stopped speaking altogether. After... A few seconds of silence, I heard my mom scream in the most horrified voice I had ever endured. Call the hospital! Oh my god, please! My mom desperately moaned. I jumped down the ladder off my bunk and opened the door. Blood was flicked on my chin and neck as mom spun around clutching her eyes. Both her hands were firmly locked on her face as I could see blood gushing through her fingers. No, 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 no. Oh God, oh God, oh God, this is gonna hurt. Daniel, Daniel, I and my mom stuttered then collapsed, smacking her head against our kitchen counter just outside my bedroom door. I dropped to my knees and began screaming, Mom, what happened? What did you do? She had to have put something in her eyes. I couldn't see through the door. I had no idea what was going on. My sister and Papa were now closely crouching behind me. My Papa had a phone in his hand and was dialing for help. Desperate to know what happened to my mom's eyes, I slowly put both my hands on hers and began to pull them away from her face. Even in her fall, she had a depth grip on her own cheeks, the bridge of her nose and eyebrows. But as I applied pressure away, it was like her muscles relaxed and willingly moved with the intentions of my mind. Initially, my mother's eyelids were caved in, as if her eyes had melted in her head. But I didn't see this until I had begun manually, instead of automatically, turning her unconscious head toward me. Right before me, I saw her eye sockets appear to be almost entirely empty. Ew. I also witnessed them once again filling, revealing blood-covered but fully restored green eyes. Uh. 
My mother was immediately conscious and blinking the blood out of her eyes. She was calm and smiled as soon as she realized we were all around her. Papa was speechless and Joanna with tear in her eyes screamed, What was that? That's a dash possible! What's going on? Why? What? I looked back at Joanna, equally horror-dashified by what just happened. As my mom continued to smile, she stood up and my papa proceeded to, um... Tell the emergency operator to send someone out regardless of the development, as none of us had any idea what was going on. By the time the first responder showed up, my mom had wiped all the blood off her face, put on makeup, and cleaned up the house. We were out in the middle of nowhere, after all. She had time. The ambulance drivers looked over my mom and concluded we were all genuinely insane. Genuinely insane, my bad. My mom was honest with them about what happened, but her con dashed and smiling didn't help any of us appearing less crazy. At about 4 a.m., I finally got to sleep, and by 6.45 a.m., I was off to school. Papa said I could stay home, but I really didn't want to be anywhere near that house for a while. I didn't talk to anyone till lunch came around. David came up to me when I was eating to apologize for being distant to me again, instead of apologizing for being distant again, but I wasn't in the mood and screamed at him to go away. I continued to eat my mashed potatoes and chicken nuggets alone, a 12-seat tay dash bowl, sitting by myself. I would dip the chicken nuggets in the mashed potatoes, scoop some of the potatoes up to my mouth with the nuggets, brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department, eat and repeat. Sometimes when I got thirsty, I would just drink my chocolate milk and think about how much I hated everyone at this point. And this is why I hate you. Nice to finally meet you with the lights on, Daniel, a voice said coming from the corner of my right eye. Refusing to look at them, I said, piss off. I could hear them chuckling under their breath. They continued. You did the same thing to me that you did to your mom last night. I would be mad, but I did that to someone when I was younger too, so I understand. I was frozen. What, was I dreaming? What sociopath nutjob was talking to me? Why would they, how would they know? I screamed, what? As I aggressively looked at them. It was, dot, 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 the special ed kid. <gasps> A voice came from the side of the cafeteria from the faculty member who were writ dutched and they pulled me out Philip when I was punching him in the face. I said, Calm down, Daniel. I will take you right to the principal. A few kids laughed and then went back to eat dusting. The special ed kids sat down. So I just thought you should know I'm here, even under this metal roof. The freckle boy said, Remember, he's special ed, as he pointed up to the ceiling of the school. He continued, Can I have your apple? As he reached out and snatched it off my tray, I remained frozen with complete tunnel vision. The boy said, Look, I can tell you're in shock and we could talk more later. He chomped into my apple, eating relatively normal, as if he was actually human. As I continued my horrified gaze, the boy asked, Did you want me to take care of anyone, by the way? Your drunk uncle? Your snobby sister? I could put quite the scare in some people. Not you, though. Not on the ship, at least. I was done looking at him. I saw a glint in his eyes that haunted me to my core. I mumbled under my breath, Please go away. Then I looked up. He was still there. He chimed in, Oh, sorry, yes. The boy bit another chunk of the apple and stood up to walk away. He was about 20 feet away before I realized I peed myself. Ew. Without hesitating, I grabbed my chocolate milk and dumped it in my lap. Damn it, I spilled my milk! I screamed in an attempt to hide the fact I was trying not to cry. Don't cry over spilled milk, Daniel. I grabbed napkins to clean up what I had known mass as a milk spill in the lunch bell rank, ending our meal break. Everyone walked away as if nothing had happened, except for me. Chapter 12, Imposters. Finally, we're getting somewhere. I didn't want to do this anymore. I don't want the dreams. I don't want this Cree duster following me around wherever I go. I'm not an idiot. It played all its cards on the table when it approached me last week. Every day at school since has been torture for me. I could, I would see it looking at me nonstop at lunch, watching me at recess. And why? Because of the metal roof on the school. Laying here in bed, thinking about all this, worried it might take me in my sleep again. Simply because my roof is mostly just tar and wood. But if it can't see me when I'm under metal, if it can't take me. Jumping up, I walked nervously into the kitchen. I grabbed a pot and a long strand of aluminum foil. I walked back to my bed with the pot and the foil brought to you by the Department of Redundancy Department. Well, I made up my ladder cautiously so I did not drop either. There, now I'm safe. The pot on my head, the foil wrapped around my entire body. They, they can't take me, right? Drifting off to sleep was difficult. Every move I made was a crunch or a crinkle sound attempting to wake me, but I was safe, dot, dot, dot. I hoped I was. Suddenly, everything felt warm. Tall grass surrounded me. A woman stood across from me in a field. 
from ba the back. She looked like my teacher. She turned around. No, she was beautiful. She had perfect breasts. Her brunette hair flowed over a naked chest. She was calling my name. Daniel, I want you to be with me. It's Victoria. <laughs> The naked woman said as she began to approach me in the grass. She, un smiling uncomfortably, I replied, I am, who are you? The, and immediately the woman reached out and began touching herself as she continued to walk across the field towards me. No, pr no proper 11 year old knows what masturbation is, okay? I didn't even know what an erection was until I was 13. Granted, that might just because I live in Texas, but still. Be with me, Daniel, she said again. A warm breeze flowed through my hair. The sunlight in the background gleamed off her perfectly toned skin. She now stood in front of me, reached her hand out as I only stared at her crutch, wondering what or who I was even looking at. Gently, she put her hand undashed under my chin and brought my eyes up to hers. Daniel, I love you, Daniel. Kiss me, she said. Leaning forward, her lips connected as her hands began running up and down my body. <laughs> Daniel, she said. Daniel, she screamed. Daniel, come out here now, she screamed even louder as her face turned gray and her eyes turned black. Jumping on my rush and the pot spinning around my head from the momentum, I heard it in real life. Daniel, I sacrificed everything for you. Stop making this difficult for exclamation points, my vo the voice screamed. Keeping the aluminum foil over my body and the pot on my head, I slid over to the wall and began to look out my window. It was the gray, the alien, and the special ed boy's body. Oh god, that sounds a bit problematic. That actually sounds very problematic for multiple reasons. His eyes kept leaking from human to black. He was staring right back at me through my tiny square wooden frame bedroom window. Take the pot off your head, Daniel, screamed the alien again. Dropped a sweat slid down the side of my face. The aluminum foil isolated my body heat and my nerves combined to begin to trigger claustrophobia. I had no idea how to react. You need to take that pot off your head. I'm trying to help you. It'll stop me, but it won't stop them. Still having no idea what to do. I reacted on instinct and ripped off a piece of aluminum, jamming, jamming it in the edges behind my window frame till I could no longer see the alien. I heard my papa scream to the outside through my sister's window, Hey freak! Get on my property or I'm calling the cops! Immediately a deafening silence consumed my ears. A silent rumble began to shake my bed. I looked up and before my eyes the wood ceiling began to warp. It was bending outward, groaning under the strength of whatever was pulling it upward! Screaming in terror, I slammed my heads over my ears with the unnatural, deep, and bone shaking sounds vibrated through my room. With little resistance, a mat stash sib suction of my roof was ripped off. I kept my eyes open, my screams of terror turned into screams of rage. Despite my entire body being consumed with anger, I was unsympathetically torn from my bed. The paw falling off my head and the aludeshinum foil now dangling to my side briefly till it began twisting, eventually falling off me, slowly drifting to the roof of my house. I screamed angrily again, but felt so powerless. This invisible beam was pulling me forcefully away from the world I knew. To my left, I saw a spark bounce of the large, cold textured ship. Another s anther spark, my bad. I couldn't hear anything but the beaming deep noise of whatever was pulling me in, but I could look down and there was my papa. He had his rifle and was shooting at the ship. This is a dream, isn't it? His mouth was moving. He was crying. I couldn't tell what he was saying, but as his tears fell he and he raised his gun again to fire once more, my vision went black. I was gone. The ship was gone. We were all lost to the world again. As I woke, I could see my right arm was missing. I was standing vertically, but not under my own power. I was in the dark room with seemingly no walls. Black tubes were packed into the stump where my arm used to be. I felt fine. I felt at peace. One of the tubes, no doubt, was drugging me to feel this way. Motherfucker, you're 11. There were three aliens now. One of them was seemingly trying to remove something from my arm which was hovering in the air near them. Hours passed and they performed numerous procedures on me. Most of them seemed to be extractions as if they were trying to undo what someone else had done to me. No shit! Chances are it's the actual aliens that, um, that other alien, the special ed kid alien, which is still problematic for multiple reasons, was warning you about. Maybe that's the case, dumbass! The tubes were removed from my body, but I didn't bleed. I wasn't sure why. The aliens retouched my limbs, and then I was gone again, lost in the lack of consciousness, lost in the dark emptiness. I woken up to see a bird looking down at me, the bright blue sky beaming through the hole in my ceiling. 
The bird tilted it his head at me, then flew away. I was in my bed, but the damage that had been done the night prior was still there. I could hear my mom crying in the other room. I could hear the chatter of other women and men in my home. Slowly, I climbed down the ladder. My arm hurt a little, but so did the rest of my body. My front room had three police officers in it, as well as my sisters, remember Christina the Yeti, mom and papa. I stood there for a moment, rubbing my eyes as they all continued to talk to one another. Joanna screamed, Daniel, and immediately ran over to me. My mom let out a painful cast and ran over to me as well. Before I knew it, F-1 was hugging me at once. It was nice to know I would be missed if I ever left for good. One of the officers spoke up. Ma'am, mom, y'all said your eyes exploded out of your head the other day. Well, show up, your eyes are fine. Say your kid is taken by aliens the other day. Your kid is right here. Can you explain? My papa stopped hugging me and turned to the officer. He said, listen, we'll handle this. I'm sorry for any inconvenience. The officer replied, we're probably going to have child service pay you a visit. This seems like an unstable home, both mentally with the mom thing and physically with whatever you did to the roof. That is not how CPS works, you dumb bastard. CPS. This is not at all how CPS works. The police don't call CPS on people who just make false calls. Bam. My mom liked me harder when she heard the officer say that. My papa said, thank you for your help on this officer. I'm sorry we called. Right after the police left, my papa said, wow, you called the cops to protect your kid and they threatened to take your kid. I think we all knew if something came up in the future, the cops wouldn't be involved. A week passed since the incident. I was at the bathroom at school using a year additional. A voice I never wanted to hear again resonated through my ears. I need to give you back what they took, Daniel. I'm not done with you. I felt a pinch in the back of my neck my head smacked against the yellow tiled wall. I was gone. <gasps> Where the chip? I read the, oh, I read the title to chapter 13. Fuck it, I have time. I'll read chapter 13 today. Chapter 13, Julia's Glow. This is going to be painful. I am not looking forward to this. It was summer. I was with my dad in Ohio. We had just arrived at a cabin in the woods. Not to be confused by a cabin in the woods. There was a girl there. Her name was Julia. She had long curly brown hair. She had a smile that lit up the room and a look in her eye that felt like a beam of energy shooting through me whenever we made eye contact. I was 5'10", despite being so young. She was about 5'1". Well, okay. I'm 5'7", so we'll assume 5'7", despite being four years older than me. We were listening to Sugar Ray on the radio, standing out on a beautiful deck, looking into the woods. She made me feel good about myself. The subtle touches on my shoulder and my hand, her giggling after every other thing I said. Ah, 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 ah. Problematic, ah, 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 problematic. I was lucky to have someone distract me from the last couple months of my life. A flashback crossed my mind. The boy in the bathroom, he must have injected me with something, done something to me. I woke up sitting in the corridor in the bathroom. A janitor was seeking me. The female principal wouldn't come in the bathroom and she, he was the only option. He smelled like alcohol. Sneak, shaking out of my thoughts, Julia. It says Julie, but I know he means Julia, and I decided to play darts. She tried, but I won with little experience. Good job, Daniel. You're a natural, she said. I replied, thank you for letting me win. She laughed. She was so cute, wearing jeans, shorts, a yellow spaghetti strap top, a thin metal necklace around her neck. I was entranced by her. Every week, Julie... Uh, and I would see each other at church. My father was part of a very small gathering he sometimes preached at. There were about 15 members, and we were all pretty closely involved. Having dinner parties at each other's houses, going out to eat after every day of church, it often felt like none of us were really there for God, but just there to have friends, dot dot dot, to have a social life. God was just the guilt that made us responsible enough to show up every week. One day, we were all praying in a circle in church. Someone was praying about how their really old grandpa got cancer, and they asked God to save him. Two weeks later, 
same person would be there, saying they understood why God let their grandpa die. But my question is, if God didn't want him to get cancer, why did he get cancer in the first place? If so, what is the point of praying about it? Motherfucker, you're 11. A lot of times, when we would pray in a circle, Julia and I would hold each other's hand. Because of my skepticism, I would often have a hard time not laughing when someone would ask God for something really stupid. Julia was more respectful than me. She would squeeze my hand the moment she detected I was about to laugh and that would help me prevent me from losing it. My dad only got to see me during the summers while my papa was out fishing in Alaska. My mom left my dad because he was accused by her two sisters and her own child of being inappropriate to an illegal extent toward them. Maybe that's where he resorted to religion so strongly to make sense of his own sense, to try and accept himself despite what a monster my family members accused him of being. One day, my dad decided to go over to Julia's parents' house after church. The majority of church followed. There was a silly little pond outside Julia's house, and she asked if I wanted to go out on a paddle boat with her and a friend of both of ours, Michael. Michael decided to bring a fishing pole for the pond and pretty quickly caught what looked like a catfish. Oh my gosh, Michael said. This is so gross. Julia paddled back to shore with me, with Michael in the back of the boat, and immediately her dad said we needed to let it go. I replied, we're not going to eat it? And her dad said, no, it was too small. I was confused, as the fish was clearly wounded, and putting it back, well, it just seemed wasteful considering we half killed it by catching it, and I was just going to die anyway, uneaten, as if it was all pointless, like life. We played in the pond a little longer till I said something to Julia, Michael made a joke about how he thought Julie lo Julia liked me, and I replied with, I hope so. That is so problematic. I think it's established that Julia is 14. No, 15 or 16. That's just, ugh, ugh. And this is a long-ass chapter, too. I'm just gonna fucking, I'm ending it here. Okay, kids, it's been a couple days. I'm gonna finish reading chapter 13 so I can fucking catch up. Julia reacted by pushing me in the water, and we all laughed. I laughed last thanks to me needing to catch my breath, brought to you at, for no reason whatsoever. Julia promptly suggested I wash off now that I was covered in pond water, so the three of us walked over to her neighbor's house, which was twice as big as hers, much newer and unoccupied as the neighbors were on vacation. Don't know why that was a relevant detail, but okay. I was about to hop in the shower. Julia was the only one in the room with me. Michael was in the music room of the mansion, strumming away on a guitar and singing funny lyrics like Don't eat the fish, the itty bitty fish, I think the meat would be so bland. Oh. Julia looked at me with a smile, clearly not ready to leave the room so I could shower. I said, well, I'm going to hop in. Julia replied, want me to join you? My heart fluttered. I then laughed awkwardly and said, you, you want to shower with me? She laughed and said, don't be too long as she walked out of the room. I blew it. She probably would have showered with me, dot, dot, dot. Why did I say that? Why didn't I just say, yes, please, thank you? Or at the very least, I would love that. The warm water felt incredible, but I couldn't help getting upset with myself. I thought about what it would be like if she was in the shower with me. Would she have taken her swimsuit and shorts off? Would we have kissed? <laughs> Before it was time for me to return home to Washington State, we had one more cabin trip to go on with a few church members. Michael was there, so was one of my sisters. Doesn't matter which one. And Michael's sister, Julia, most importantly, remained close to me the entire first day of us being there. All of the kids were to sleep upstairs in sleep dashing baths on a big carpeted room at the cabin. It consumed the entire upper floor. Julia was staring at me from her sleeping bag for most of the time the lights re dash on the in the cabin. She was smiling every time I looked at her, and I would smile back upon seeing this. There was a pillow between her sleeping bag and mine. She had put her hand under the pillow in a way that only made sense if she was reaching out to me. So I reached my hand out and held hers. No one else in the room had any 
After a short while, the lights went out and that's when Julie began moving toward Dash toward me, slipping her body inside my sleeping bag. <coughs> she immediately began kissing me and I kissed her back just as aggressively. I had never kissed a girl before this moment, but it seemed like I was doing every Dash thing right. With one hand, I unbuttoned her shorts and slipped my hand into her underwear. This, again, was the first time I ever touched someone like this. Julia, now on top of me, began breathing heavily as my fingers moved in and out of her. She continued to kiss me and began to grind on me as well. After 20 minutes of one of the best moments in my life to date, she buttoned her shorts back up and kissed me goodnight. I was glowing, and not to my knowledge at the time, it wasn't even over. The next morning, Julia and I were the first two people to wake up in the house. I found her sitting on the couch downstairs and realizing we were still alone, we again threw ourselves at each other in exactly the same way we had last night. Now on the couch in the cabin front room. The fabric of the couch had a purple base color and a design tributing the natives of America. And I don't give a shit. I ran my hand up and down her legs. I pulled her body as close to me as I could. I tried to make her as well as loved and blissful as I knew how. She seemed so happy. Good morning, my dad's voice boomed from the back room. Julia quickly sat up while zipping her pants. I slowly reacted with a smile and a good morning back. I could see Julie was Julia was beaming. It was sad I had to go home soon, back to that bedroom, back to that school, but my mom had custody, and the only reason I wanted to say was the thought of a beautiful girl who would probably be embarrassed to ever publicly date me, considering our age gap. The planned ride home was a call one. <laughs>